Welcome to No Code, No Limit. Um, my name is not Christine. My name is Jens Mönig. I'm a researcher at SAP. Um, my project is the visual programming language SNAP. Um, in this talk, I'll explore how live general purpose programming blocks can help model processes. Make sure to also stay around and tune in to Tom Beckman's talk right after this one. Um, Tom will report about his architecture that uses graphical blocks to scale up to large systems even. Um, so we've come to refer to daringly ambitious goals as moonshots. Now, two generations ago, um, a young woman um, with her team of mathematicians and programmers accomplished the moonshot. Um, I'm speaking of Margaret Hamilton um, at MIT. This iconic photograph from 1969, Margaret is standing next to a stack of printouts of the program she wrote for the Apollo guidance computer. Margaret's code literally put the first man on the moon. And in doing so, she also invented and defined the practice uh, and term that we now refer to as software engineering. Um, Margaret actually did not use a high level programming language for this, but low level assembly code. Um, this is the name of the master ignition routine of the lunar module, Burn Baby. How cool is that? So it is our ambition to make moonshots possible in a playful way to program that was also invented at MIT for children. Now, serious adults will sometimes use graphical diagrams known as business process models. Um, I've made a little prototype so we can check it out, how this would work. This would be how Margaret's manager would define a moonshot. So this is a start a process. We can make a task, um, make a task, call it. Um, uh, so this is gonna be a bit cumbersome. Um, okay, this is how Margaret's manager might define a moonshot. So we could do, you know, task lift off. There's a next task that um, would be like uh, land on moon. And then there's gonna be another task. Of course, once we're on the moon, we're gonna to have to uh, plant a flag. And for the purpose of this um, process, we will terminate after that. So this is like a simple, um, flow diagram and we could spice this up with some data flows. For example, the liftoff task could have an output, um, like uh, we have a rocket and that rocket would be um, needed to land on the moon. Once we're on the moon, um, that process could also have an output. Um, for example, it'd be Neil and we need Neil to plant the flag. And um, so, this is starting to take shape. So we could also visualize that this is happening somewhere else, like on the moon and kind of turn this into a waterfall project there. Here's your process, Margaret, go execute. And we can already see that this is useful to talk about maybe large ideas, but it's a little bit cumbersome to actually do something more spectacular in languages such as these. For example, it's hard to model an algorithm like a loop or something. Um, so this is how we could refine the process uh, some more uh, to also consider the fact that there was um, an orbiter uh, while the lunar module was on the moon. And so this is very high level and we would have to refine this model a lot. And it's very likely that by the time we actually model the whole Apollo 11 mission, printing it out would well use up more paper than uh, we've seen in Margaret's stack. So SNAP um, was made, it's our ambition to support, we're interested in computer science education at the college and high school level. It's an interactive programming language. It's blocks based, it runs in the browser. It's made 
for UC Berkeley's introductory computer science course. We're very proud that we're having a large audience. Um, sometimes we're popping in and out of even the, <laughs> it's a little ridiculous, like the top 100 programming languages in the Taiyobi index. It's free and open source for everybody. And it's not just me, there's a team, um, joint team at SAP and UC Berkeley. At UC Berkeley, there's uh, my co-author, Brian Harvey. Then there's Dan Garcia working on curriculum, Michael Ball working on the back end. Here at SAP, we're also a team. There's Yadka Hügle and Bernard. Hi, Yadka. Hi, Bernard. Um, and this is how we're building processes in Okay, excellent. So, so here we're in the operators category. This is how a process or a procedure looks like in, in SNAP, for example. And this is how an input, we can type it in into a slot. So six plus four is 10. We can use such a block, such a process, a procedure as an input to another one. And this is how we would model a, um, a average of two numbers. Um, so we also have lists, kind of aggregates of data in in SNAP, so we could also try to um, get the average of um, some more numbers. And how would we do this? So we have blocks, for example, that take other blocks as an input, um, higher order functions. So we could combine this list with the plus operator and we get the sum of it. And then we could just pass that into and divide it not by two, but by the length of that list, which is three, to get the average of this list. And we can turn this into a procedure um, by making a new block. Snap is also called build your own block. So we make the average block and take the average of data. We get a new block down here. We can define data as an input and we can say it's a list. And now we can apply and we get this new block and we wanna test it out with this list um, and it doesn't do anything because we haven't defined it yet. What we can do is we can just take these blocks and drag them into the definition. Now we have this input data. This is going to be the list. We're gonna make the sum of all the items in the list. We're gonna to have to divide it by the length of that list. So it works on any data. So let's try this. Now we're getting, we're having a new block for the average. Okay. Well, I I have several deck tops. So it's time to, man <laughs> you know, you can see it. It's time to kind of manage your expectations for what time is left. Um, I, first, I'm going to raise your expectations and say I'm going to demo a very famous process, uh, uh, like a really cool thing. When I'm actually done doing it, you'll be disappointed because it's not going to be so great. Then I'm just literally going to do some random stuff. And then you'll be delighted. So the famous process I'm gonna to show to you goes back to 1982, the movie Tron, Disney movie Tron, one of the first movies that made extensive use of computerized visual effects. One of the programmers working on these effects um, was Ken Perlin. And um, Ken was dissatisfied with how technically, how kind of machine-like the graphics looked. And he was looking for ways to make awesome graphical effects. It didn't quite make it for the release of Tron, but right after Tron got released, kind of Ken had this breakthrough and he came up with this super special graphic effect that everybody started to use and everybody's still using it. And it made Ken really famous. Ken got the most amazing award for this invention, not the Turing Award, but an actual Oscar. Um, did you know you can win an Oscar as a programmer? Um, okay, let me actually show you Ken's process. Um, so you can see Snap again? Yes. Okay, awesome. Um, so. Um, for this super special graphic effect, we're going to just take this um, picture of an astronaut. And I'm going to start with making a variable. It's, we're going to call it layers. I'm going to set the layers to um, a new list. In fact, I'm going to initialize this now. And now I'm going to code this algorithm, and it's going to look almost ridiculous. Um, so first, I'm going to add this costume, kind of this picture of the astronaut to 
the list of layers. Um, the other way around. Then I'll grow the astronaut, double its size, make it go to a random position. I'm going to make it stamp whatever picture it has on the stage. I'm going to make it go back to the center. Um, I'm going to make it shrink again to 100%. And I'm going to make it wear the costume that it previously stamped on the stage, the pen trails, and clear the stage. Hey, this is one of the most famous algorithms in computer science uh, in CGI. Let's actually click this once. You can see now the astronaut is getting bigger and I got this one picture of the astronaut in my list of layers. I'm gonna click on this again. Now there's a second one. I'm just gonna click on this a couple of times, four, five, six, seven, eight. Um, that's about the number that um, Ken Perlin used. So I'm gonna complete this algorithm by saying, okay, this is gonna do eight times. So now I have this list of eight pictures that kind of increasingly zoom into a random part of the astronaut. What I wanna do is I wanna combine these layers into one picture. Um, so what I can do is I can uh, get the pixels of any uh, picture that I have, like the current picture has a bunch of pixels. Um, this is a list of 172,000 rows and, um, and, and four columns, the RGBA values of the picture I have right now. So what if I put in the list of layers, I'm getting a more complex table, which is actually another view for a list of matrices, a list of tables of these eight layers, 172,800 uh, pixels each. So I want to combine these all, average them into one image. And so we've already defined an average function, but that worked only for numbers. So here's something that we added to SNAP. Um, we added the idea from APL that we can extend the domain of arithmetic functions to work with any granularity of data. So it also works with vectors, with matrices. So I can just take all these pixels and average them as if they just were a number. So I can click on this. And what I'm getting now is a single matrix that has all the averages of the pictures in there. So I wanna see what that looks like. I wanna actually switch to that costume. So here comes the, one of the greatest graphic effects of all time, switching to that costume. Okay, um, let's maybe try this again. Uh, go to the original costume, click on this again. Ah, okay, here's the point where you're underwhelmed, okay? Um, so this isn't, um, doesn't actually look so great. Um, I've raised your expectations and the graphic effect um, that I ceremoniously made you wait for didn't turn out so great. So I promised I'd do something random and I'm, I'm quite literally talking about random stuff. Can you see this um, snap pane now? Yes. Somebody tell me? Okay, awesome. So, so this is the algorithm we just wrote. Um, and what if instead of this picture with the astronaut, we just take some random pixels? This is a little procedure that just makes random pixels. If I click on it, it'll just be random, random grayscale pixels. Now we use that same algorithm on just this random stuff and look what happens. We got this kind of amazing kind of foggy picture. And this is the stuff that Ken Perlin has become famous for because now we can use this. We can, for example, just apply different colors to it. So now it kind of looks like clouds in the sky. Or we could take any colors to it. Now it kind of looks like fog out of hell. Um, and it's really just kind of what is called noise. Remember, this is all made up of several layers. We can decide not to take all the layers, but just take a few. Let's, let's just take the last three and um, see what that looks like. So it kind of looks like uh, a little blurry. Blurry noise is also kind of nice because we can draw lines across it. 
And in drawing the lines, we can change the directions of the lines to reflect the grayness. Let's actually try this and see what happens. Now, as we're drawing lines over this noise, we're getting some kind of interesting map that almost looks like rivulets, like hair. It's a kind of a natural shape. So Perlin noise, as it's called, has these interesting features. Um, let's actually clear it, and, and here it is again. We can also um, have different colors for it. Here I'm, I'm setting a couple of thresholds and it kind of looks like an island with beach. Um, you can take several of these layers and, and, and get more detail. Now we're getting a map, almost with more detail. We can even kind of zoom out and get more detail. Um, in fact, I'm gonna stay with them somewhere in the middle. And we can, in a live programming environment, such as Snap, we can play with the thresholds. I've already named these thresholds like sea level or beach. So in Snap, we have the ability to add input sliders and to re-execute a procedure as um, we're changing a value. So we can click on any number and now just drag this uh, slide and we get simulations, for example, of global warming or of rising sea level, of melting ice, uh, things like that. We can also take this picture and horizontally slice it so we get different layers. And once we're done with these different layers, there's this other property that we can render them isometrically um, just on top of each other. And what we're getting is a three-dimensional terrain shape. And, and so Perlin noise lets us model all kinds of natural things like wood or water or things like that. And this is why it's actually cool. So see, I did promise you too much. Um, so going back to Margaret and her stack of code, we already know that with lots of code, we can accomplish fantastic things like in Moonshot. Now the idea is, what do we do when we don't have lots of codes? Often we just fail, we just produce fails because taking things away is the Latin word for abstraction. So for everything that we take away, we need to compensate it with something that raises the angle of what we're gonna reach. So the things that we can take or that we think about is, um, for example, structured programming, a high level programming language that has loops and variables and events and objects. To further raise the angle, we're thinking about functional programming, lambda calculus, high order functions that let us model control structures. And I've also shown you with the average uh, block that uh, we can take linear algebra to further increase it. And there are a bunch of more uh, abstractions we can think about that make your system more powerful. And the idea is to combine it all with a graphical way with blocks so we really can reach anything. So it's really about compensating what we take away with something that has more meaning. So I'm returning to the question, is it really no code? Kind of what I've shown you was very expressive. So if it's expressive, it really is programming, right? Regardless of whether we're typing it in with a keyboard. We have to know that as we're dealing with less code, it becomes more expressive. So it increases the cognitive load. Um, things don't get easier things get more powerful. So which is why I'd like to talk about high productivity instead of no code instead. Burn baby, thank you. <laughs>